Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, The Complexities of SV Analytical Ultracentrifugation. AAVs are not simple binary systems. My name is Akash Bhattacharya, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. The views expressed in this webinar are those of the speaker and not of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. For more information on Beckman Coulter Solutions, please visit www.beckman.com slash resources. Before we get started, we'd like to get to know our audience with a couple of questions. So here's the first question. Is analytical ultracentrifugation, or AUC, currently a part of your analytical workflows? Option A for yes, and option B for no. This question should appear on your screen right now. The second audience poll question is, are good manufacturing practices, or GMP, important to your analytical workflow needs? Option A for very important, option B for somewhat important, option C for not very important, option D, not important at all, and option E for I am not sure. And the third and final audience poll question is, your work environment is best described as option A for R&D or discovery, option B for process development, option C for manufacturing, and option D for quality control or analytical development or characterization. Now that we've taken a moment to answer these questions, I'd like to thank you all for your answers. With that, I would also like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. Also, Please notice that you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the social sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. If you're having trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our speaker, Dr. Lake Paul, founder and president of Bioanalysis LLC. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Paul, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Akash, for the, for the introduction. <clears throat> Today I want to talk about um, the complexities of um, AUC, specifically in relation to the um, gene therapy field. Um, the gene therapy field has um, really exploded over the last few years. Well, it has previously, but now it's become one of the forefront um, frontiers of uh, revolutionary and transformative medicine in, um, in our modern history. And AUC is playing a critical role in these types of, um, of therapy. So what I want to talk about today is some of the, the characterization and some of the information that you can gather from using sedimentation velocity and vertical centrifugation and apply it to your gene therapy field. Now, please note that this is not limited to only AAVs, but can be applied to your lentiviral systems 
or your you know modified um, synthetic systems. So it is a very versatile type of application. And given that the FDA, the EMEA, are now recognizing that AUC is one of the critical components of this type of analysis, it's paramount that we really focus on what kind of relative information we can get. So before I start um, going into the nitty-gritty details of um, what analytic authentication can do for the AAV systems, I'd like to give a little history of what um, we see in um, over the years um, of um, u utilizing AUC and where it, had, where it began and then where it is now in the present day. So what we see here on the um, screen on the left-hand side is the original centrifuge that Theodore Sedberg um, developed in 28, 26, 1926. Um, at Uppsala and in Wisconsin, this is the the first um, centrifuge, and it took a, it was a very large, very complicated instrument. But with this, he won the Nobel Prize to looking at glow, uh, gold colloidal um, systems and then characterizing the molecular weights. As time went by, you know, the centrifuge um, became smaller. <laughs> in this case, um, we had the uh, Spinco uh, Model E systems which was basically a room, um, the size of a room. So this actually helped um, modernize the centrifuge. But what happened is that it be, it, the centrifuge became very specialized, and it took a special operator to really um, divulge and get the information from the, uh, from the, the, the data. In addition to that, <clears throat> with the advances of you know what we consider at that time what we consider modern uh, technology, your SDS page sizing columns, uh, it became um, very um, not very intuitive to use a complicated system to get the molecular weights or distributions when you can use a simplest system like a SDS page or a SEC column to get the molecular weight. So during that time, it, it fell out of grace. And there was not a lot of development um, put into the, the centrifuge at this time. It, it is called, it, this is during the 70s. So what happened is a whole generation of scientists uh, did not get, did not learn about the centrifuge. <clears throat> However, in um, um, around the, the early 90s to late 90s, some of the um, um, pioneers of the, um, um, the centrifuge field Tom Lowey, uh, Philo, Yafantis, Shockman, continue to push for um, better technologies. And in this case, Beckman responded by producing the XLA and XLI. And these instruments um, during their late 90s, um, early 90s, really put the, the centrifuge to the forefront. And it came from the software. Um, with Boris Delimere software, Philo software, and Shook software that made it even, made these complex calculations, complex fitting data analysis, more accessible to the masses. And with that, it, it really um, blossomed the field. Um, late, recently, Beckman has pushed out the new Optima AUC, which improves upon the technologies that we have seen in the um, the XLA and XLI, and you know, improve scanning frequency, uh, better uh, optical systems, faster collection rates, you know, better cooling systems once it's fixed, and so forth. And so it, it, it's pushing the boundaries again with the Optima AUC. And with that, and uh, with these modern softwares, you can really now apply the the, the theory um, and the 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 versatility of the AUC to a wide variety of systems. Now, AUC is not limited just to biologics. It's being used very, very much in the nanoparticle field and the polymer field. And, you know, it, it, it's just a very versatile instrument. And it is the gold standard in measuring, measuring size distributions, molecular weights, hetero and self associations. <clears throat> So one of the things I want to talk about is that 
all of the, the, the experiments that you do with AUC are based on first principles. That means there's no modification of your system. You pipe it in your, um, your, um, your sample into the, the, uh, the two sectors, into the, sector, the, uh, the sample sector, pipe, in, pipe it in your, uh, your buffer into the reference sector, and you apply the centrifugal force. From that, you watch the boundaries move. That's it. Very simple experimental setup without any need for immobilization, labeling, um, modification of your of your of your system. But with that comes a great weight on the secondary um, analyses that goes into it. There's always a saying: garbage in, garbage out. So you have to be very careful in your sample preparation to get the most highly um, pure, not even pure, but highly good sample, really good sample to put in. And that's not a limitation, but it's, you know, effort has to be made, made up front to really know what your buffer constituents are and how your sample behaves. So with this, you know, there are several different approaches on the, on the uh, analysis of the, of, of the data. Now, what we, when we look at sedimentation uh, boundaries, all we see is a, you know, the curvature of your solvent, your plateau region, and your reaction boundaries if you have a hetero or self-associated systems. And we have to fit the Lamb equation, the Sever equation, which is the derivative of that. And it is a model fitted that you're looking at. You're, you're not looking at a direct data output, as per se, if you're looking at a mass spectrometry data in which you have the masses and you can figure out the differences between the, uh, the masses to figure out your, um, your amino acid composition. This is a model-fitted type of analysis. So the hardest part in these type of analysis is realizing which is real, which peaks are real, and which, which, which ones are not. And you have to do multiple approaches to really know what is real and what is not real. And this is the major complaint of everyone else who uh, is doing alternative methods to look at, for example, your MT4 ratio. So, for example, if you're doing sec models, um, they, they, they claim um, it's very easy to do. That's the first thing they say. It's very easy to do, but there's information being uh, missed. If you use um, CDMES, very easy to do. Well, right now, it's pretty difficult, but it's, um, that technology is um, improving. But there are information to be known. You have to deconvolute a very um, a charge envelope to get your data. Um, in, in terms of your, the new CESDS, I mean, there's a, a lot of reproducibility problems, but you know you have to do a lot of sample prep at that point in time. Now, the biggest complaint, going back to that my, my original um, proposal, the biggest complaint is you re it requires an expert to do it. Yes, this is true, but to get to the level of expert, this requires training. And education, educating the masses on how to do this is an easier task than trying to reinvent the wheel. And AUC is the gold standard. Sec models, CDM, CDMS, um, CDMS, um, uh, CESDS, all go back to AUC for um, for um, for confirmation. Even your cryo EM and your TEM data requires the same. However, you have to when you're doing your um, data analysis, you have to be very careful in how you model model it. So in this case, there's multiple people have developed um, strategies on how to do this type of uh, fitting of the data, in which you go from regularization to least square um, minimization and different outputs of your data. One of the biggest things that I have to tell everyone, your CFS distribution, your GFS distribution is not a chromatogram. Please think of it as it looks like a chromatogram, but it is not. It is a fit of the data. And this is a very, very key and important point. So one of the some of the softwares that have come along the DCDT plus by you know Philo said it now by Stafford Ultraspan by Boris Setfit and Setfat by uh, Peter uh, Peter Shook these programs are wonderful each has its strengths and each has its weaknesses I implore people to try all 
and see which one um, um, best fits your system. Or as in my case, I'm very agnostic, I use them all to get to the right data, um, the right um, conclusion. So with, um, with these modern software, it's very easy um, to, to um, figure out what is in your system from a first approach. So what we want to look at um, um, next is the history of um, AUC and viruses. Now, Schachmann um, did this in 1949, 1950, and he thought he, he did a great study on the tobacco mosaic virus. The techniques and mythology has, um, has already been established. All you have to do is go and read. And, and from those reading of those wonderful papers and wonderful book chapters and books that um, um, the Shockman has written, um, um, Jack Correa, um, Stafford, Stephen Harden, and Arthur Rowe, all of these guys have developed the methods already. All you have to do is go back and read and apply. Now, one of the things that we're looking at here is um, basically this, uh, on your, the blue figure right there is your tobacco mosaic virus. The middle figure there is your bone mosaic virus, and that's an AEV um, on your right-hand side. Sherling Optics was used in this case. One of the coolest things about this is that June in 1951 was the first evidence of shell sharpening, which is a common problem in large particles, um, especially when um, looking at um, the AEVs. It can be a problem, and there's some things you have to really think about it um, in this case. So. This is, you have all information already in, uh, at your graphs. It just requires a little bit of reading or um, come talk to one of um, myself or any other experts you can find in the area and we can direct you or we can help you with these kind of situations. Now, let's go right into the gene therapy area and look at the um, CQAs for the system. Now, traditionally we are looking at percent empty, percent full. Now, we can take that and expand upon that and look at your percent intermediate slash partials, look at your lower order capsids, which is anything lower than, um, than your uh, smaller or lower in, 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 in S value range than your empty capsid, or your higher order capsids, which is anything greater than your full capsid, in this case, could be aggregates. And you can expand upon that. But right now, the FDA, um, the EMEA are focused on the MD capsid, but I can tell you, this is going to change. They, will, they are seeing the power of AUC, and it can do much more than that. So when you're looking at these systems, you have to think about either character, or the, the first step is characterization, and then the CQA, um, at that point in time, you establish what your CQA um, um, needs to be, and you use the AUC to help that question. Now, you can look at the impurity, um, impurity and flash in, um, purity profile. You can detect um, small um, proteins in there. Rep68 is one of them. Um, there's a paper that's coming out that looks at the um, organization state of Rep68, which helps with protein integration. If your purification system is, is um, um, troublesome, you can see this protein in there. Yes, you can. Um, and you can see the AUC quantified. And it's, 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 it, you, can, you can really assess your impurity profile. Um, if you're clever, um, using some clever tricks, you can figure out the DNA loading of the, um, the viral particles. Um, you can look at your ratios for your process and manufacturing consistencies. And I mentioned um, high order capsids. Extinction coefficients. Um, Tom Lowy and um, a lot of other authors use AUC to determine the extinction coefficients uh, of your protein. You don't have to do amino acid hydrolysis to figure this out. You can do it with diff, um, using a multi-signal type of system. Um, he, he, um, the second, la, um, the, the last three um, points in there are mainly uh, for mass spectrometry. We're not going to go into that. Um, but overall, you can look at your um, CQA of your system, especially when it comes to AUC, um, to look at your uh, empty capsid, partial capsid, full capsids, contaminant um, um, profile, and so forth. Now, um, TEM is a good technique, but it has its limitations. 
Um, Cryo-M is a good technique, but it has limitations. Same with set models, has limitations. And you have to know what limitations you want to do to live with it. Um, so what I wanted to do, go, for, um, go into is basically some of the, um, I'm going to touch bases on some of the multi-signal approaches. Now, on your left-hand side is some boundaries, um, both from a um, interference optic system and a um, absorbance optic system. And you can exploit the, intri uh, the intrinsic properties of your, um, of your system because Bayer's law is additive. If you know your DNA, extrinsic coefficient of DNA, you can, um, and you know your extrinsic coefficient of your capsid, you can figure that out. The same properties are for your interference optics, which is based off of your, um, your DNDC, your refractive index. So your DNA is about 0.17, and your protein is about 0.188. And you can estimate your package system in there. You can confirm your, um, your contaminant if it has DNA in it. You can look at the signal differences. You can um, look at your aggregates to figure out whether it is a dimer of your 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 of your of your of your full capsids or your empty capsids and so forth. You can figure all of this out in a single run. Okay? You just you can you can do this once you have properly designed the experiment. Um, and then there's a lot more information you can do with a multi signal. Now you can globally fit this data or you can um, fit it individually. Both approaches can work and it requires a little more time, but it can be done. And once it's done, you have a great package to put into your IND, your BLA or MMA. Um, what I want to talk about next, we all know this about your um, empty, partial, and full. Um, the, the, the LOD, Actually, I have to change this LOD because you can get LOD sub 1%. Sub 1%. Think about that for a second. That is looking at a very minute amount of um, um, empty capsids or capsids in this case. And you can get LOQs that is sub um, 2% at times. Um, so you have to be very careful in how you design these experiments to get these type of low um, LODs and low LOQs. Now, your inter intra reproducibility, one to one five, one to one point five percent standard deviations, and this was, you know, performed by um, 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 a colleague of mine, Richard Hearn, in which she looked at this um, type of um, intra and inter uh, reproducibility and found this out. Personally, I found this. Um, you can have very, very low standard deviation, es um, especially when it comes to your sedimentation coefficients. I mean, you can have plus or minus 0.2 um, S values shift. Um, it's very, very robust in this type of um, um, environment. And this is what you need to develop a really good method. And as I said before, I mentioned, it's compatible with many systems and it's done in your native matrices. So there's no need for labeling, labeling um, staining, or immobilization. It is a wonderful system in, in, in terms of that. Um, when we go into experimental design, this is a very, very critical um, portion of your, um, of, your, um, of your system in which you have to spend the most time in. Now, your selection of growth of speed. You spin too fast, you can have some problems. Self-sharpening, you can have non-ideality, you can have a lot of problems You can you, um, with, with too fast of a, uh, a road to speed. But there, you, know, you still get data. But is it the best data? Sometimes not. Sometimes it can be with, um, with slower road to speed. Just remember, you get a better handle on your diffusion if you spin it slower because the boundaries are um, separate, are uh, diffusion limited, so square root of the average of d times your time. Um, so too fast, you have non-ideality. Um, you can have, um, sometimes you can have better resolution, but that can create more problems in your data fitted, okay? And that's something of walking of species which are very close together or close to a, um, a very 
abundant um, species in your system. If you too, run too slow, you have a long experimental time, so that's a, a lower throughput, um, lower resolution, but it's a delicate balance between that. And as I said before, you get a better handle on your diffusion. Your assay concentrations, very, very important. The linearity um, of your optical system is about 0.1 to 1.0, and sometimes you can put it up to 1.2, depending on your system. Um, anywhere in between that. I recommend you do it anything above 0.5 to get the best ideal. However, remember, you don't have to be at 0.5 OD units to get the best data. You can get data from 0.01. It's going to have a lot of noise, but there's some things in there you can figure out. You can get good data at 0.1 OD units at 230. It is still good data, okay? Um, so no one should tell you that you have to put your assay at 0.5. Absolutely incorrect. It's um, it's a uh, you can anyway any any points in that point one to one point two one point zero range will give you good data. Um, however, the lower the concentrations that you get, you get the broadening of the peaks. This is a function of CEPHID and regularization. Um, it becomes a little problematic in your system. Now there are different approaches to this. Um, to figure out whether your peaks are um, or real or um, where it's centered at. Um, so, you know, you have to really be careful with, with how you're doing your assay concentrations. Just remember, if you're doing an assay in which you're looking at, say, 3% of your MTs in there, you're not going to use a very low concentration to get that because that at that point in time, your overall signal for your um, your empty capsid or partial capsid is going to be 3% of the total. Okay, so you want to have enough um, signal in there that is differentiable um, from your noise to give you the best type of result. So you have to be very careful in your assay concentrations. One of the other things that you're going to have is the ripple effect um, because of regularization and how it works. Um, and that's going out to the higher um, S values. So. In reality, this is simulated data. This is what we expect. I mean, nice peaks at you know around 65 for your empty. Depends on your size of your insert. In this case, maybe uh, your weighted average of your full capsid peak, your FC is around you know, 101. But in reality, that's what you get in the blue line, a smear at times, and it's not that easy to um, figure out your positioning of your um, um, your empty capsids, what is intermediate, your full capsid, if you have a really good system, um, that peak will be nice and sharp. But once you start getting, you know, you're, you're, you're self-defeating at every point in time, in which you are trying to reduce the empty and partial, which in turn makes the analysis more difficult to do um, because you have a lower concentration at this point in time and you can have merging of peaks. So, that's some of the things that you have to take into consideration when you're going um, um, doing your assays. But there's a workaround to this. So if we look at the analytical landscape, so let's look at the little funnel on the side there. This is how I approach my methodology to do the um, to generate your final distribution. Now the FDA, the EMEA. And all these regulatory agencies have are have seen the CFS distribution. We will look at that as um, the the final output. But how do you get to that final CFS distribution to make sure that it is absolutely correct? And that's the thing. You have to not rely. You if you rely too much on one analysis, you're going to go on a, a very very bad path. And I, I, I'm of the mind orthogonal analyses, orthogonal methods, uh, sorry, orthogonal data fitted is the key. So at this point in time, you have to do some of your um, orthogonal modeling. And this is a LSG star S, a G, a G star S analyses, or even a hybrid continuous local discrete global um, analyses. This is in setbacks, so a little more complicated. 
Um, so you can look at these type of, uh, of um, distributions. So the first thing we're going to look at, the first input you get is your CFS distribution and it's going to be your last. You're going to use that for your um, distribution modeling. That is where you start at. Now, your RMSD, a lot of folks rely on the RMSD. This can be misleading. Um, at some points, if you load enough data into the CEDFIT, you're going to artificially lower your RMSD. Okay? That, what you have to do is a comparative analysis looking at the global chi square changes of your um, RMSD between FIT1 and FIT2. And this goes, it's an iterative process to figure out whether you are stuck in a local or a global minimum. And you have to be able to um, do this type of analysis, looking at your global chi-square, looking at your um, confidence intervals that you have, looking at the, the, the landscape, this, um, um, the surface error projections of your data. This is all built into set fat, um, set fit and set fat, and um, your um, um, ultra scan and so forth. You have to look at these data. Um, certain programs do rely on RMSD, which is, but that's a different type of analysis and a different approach to the um, solution to the um, severity equation. So you have to be very careful on, on what, what your RMSD really means. Look at your boundaries. Look at your systematic errors. Look for systematicity and so forth. Your fitting parameters have to be optimized. You have to know what your um, TI and RI noise are doing in your systems. UltraScan likes both TI and RI. In said fit, the application has to be very systematic. For example, your RI noise was originally done for um, interference data by applying it to your absorbance data. As Philo would say, if your data, your data should be good enough coming out of the centrifuge to require no noise um, correction. Yes and no. The TI noise, yes. The RI noise, probably not. So you have to be very careful in that. The amount of regularization, this is a very critical point. People are very um, keen to do it at 0.95. But you have to know what the regularization is doing and how to apply this type of um, um, confidence to your um, data. So when you're looking at your maximum entropy or your second derivative type of um, um, analyses, they have to be able to align. Um, they have to tell you the same thing at the same time. There's also the Bayesian implementation um, that is in said, um, said fit that not a lot of people use, but it can be done very effectively to look at capsid um, heterogeneity. Um, your CS model, does it make sense? Identification of your artificial peaks, how to get out of a local minima. Um, there are steps to do this. Your data, remember that the, the error surface is very, very complicated and filled with local minimas before you can get to your, your global minima. So you have to learn how to do um, an iterative approach to get to the, the best solution of your data. And those are some of the things you, you, you will learn over time how to do this, There's iterative approaches to this, changing the values that you're fit into non-optimal and see where it, it converges back, looking at your, your chi-squared um, changes, um, looking at um, um, your um, the, the histogram plot that you, we have now in, um, implemented in, 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 in CEDFIT. Um, you can look at these type of things and figure out what, what makes the sense. Now, the most critical part of this is identification of peaks that are real and not real. Everything in there, um, based off the, the function of regularization, it is saying that every sedimentation coefficient is possible. So you have to take, keep that in mind, that everything is possible. So when you're looking at your derivatives, um, your solution, is this the true solution? Okay? And there are different ways to approach that. So let's, this is a good, a good um, um, example of what we're seeing here. So of the power of these programs that you have. So if you look at this data here, I mean, it's, it's not um, one of those, um, you know, uh, means in which you look and you find you're going to see uh, a blue dress or a green dress or something like that. This is random noise. However, 
when you apply said fit, this is a beautiful fit. I mean, if you look at that, um, the gray panel in there, there's no hard um, diagonal line that shows, that indicates no systematicity in the error. The residuals are very, um, very nice. No systematic error in there. But the solution is wrong. It is wrong. It is basically fitting noise to something. And that's the power of these um, regularization that you have. Um, what the, if you, for all the Marvel folks out there, um, if you like Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. This is what we're trying to um, implement here, is you have to be very careful in your solutions. So be careful and on, on how, what date, what date you're looking at and how it's being um, processed. So let's continue on. You have to know the limitations. Um, so one of the things of maximum entropy is a tendency to merge two very close peaks. So once this, the concentrations are very low, it starts to pull those in. It, it is designed initially to give the sharpest peak, but at low concentrations, you start to see um, uh, merging. Um, sometimes it pulls um, concentrations from larger peaks that implement in there. Um, so that is some of the things that we have to, um, um, to think about. In addition, it's over large distributions, you have um, um, oscillations. So you have to be very careful. So what I want to look at here, you have your ideal versus expected. And what we need to do is look at the um, what we're going to do is to discrete, uh, a kind of a iterative approach to look at discrete models um, of the data. So in this case, I simulated the data. I knew what was in there, so I fit four models to uh, this discrete species. So it's telling me that this, this solution has at least four um, um, species in there that can describe this data. In addition to that, I do LSG star or G star S. It doesn't have the resolution, but it gives you good quantitative values and shows that um, if your profile is looking relatively the same, you can you know, make a, a good decision on this. In addition to that, um, what you can look at is your, um, your, basically you're trying to refine your fit. So what I did, I took that blue um, um, reality data and refined that same data to give me discrete species. And this is very critical when it comes to translating the AUC into the CGMP environment as a release test. It is your peaks that has to be discernible from each other for, um, for proper integration. And that is one of the major um, um, issues that I see a lot is these peaks are merging because of improper fits. And you can really tease these out, implement, implement a robust method that will do all of this type of uh, analysis and give you good, a good method that is really uh, robust in the um, GMP um, world. So let's go, go back. So this is basically what we are looking at for process development and, um, and characterization of your system. These, the size of these balls are, are critical because it, you take a larger time in this, in this, in this area to give you your final distribution. So once you have this, it is a little bit easier to go into the GMP. So do the work upfront. So what you're looking at a GMP method, it has to be robust. It has to be um, reproducible. It has to be able to measure analytical response regions very, um, very repetitively and in a good order. So it does take a little more time in your experimental. Um, design to get that, and then your signal to noise evaluation. Not so much of your orthogonal uh, modeling, but you have to confirm your data. And I've developed methods in which they can you can throw a kitchen sink at it, and it will pass. It will pick up what it needs to pick up, and it um, it will respond the way it responds without any type of unwanted or fitted OSs and so forth. Well, anyways, this brings me to the end of my talk, and um, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Okay, thank you, Dr. Paul, for this extremely informative presentation. So 
uh, for the audience, while we give Dr. Paul a couple of moments to catch his breath, maybe get a sip of water, before we go into the main Q&A portion, we would like to know if AUC is a future consideration for your laboratory. Please select from one of the options, A, not applicable, I'm already using AUC. Option B, yes, and I would like to speak to a specialist. Option C, maybe, but I'm unsure whether it's a fit for my samples. Option D, I'm not sure, I need more information. And option E, for no, I do not foresee a future need. Based upon your responses uh, to these questions, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences will get in touch with you uh, for further discussions. Thank you for your selections. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. And with that, let's get started. Our first question of the day is as follows. What are the key factors that I should consider helping me decide if I should bring AUC in-house versus sending out to a CRO? Lake? So this is a good question. And um, thank you, um, Akash. Um, so the first thing for AUC in-house uh, is that you can you have control over you know, your methods and so forth. Um, send out the CRO. I'm, I'm biased because I am a CRO, so you always want to have that expertise. The, 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 high, the major critical, the, the, crazy, the critical point in bringing an AUC in-house is having an expert that really knows what they're doing with AUC. And I mean by expert is someone who has looked at different systems, not only MABs, not only viral systems, but has really explored the space and, um, of AUC in terms of experimental design. Because the applications of AUC um, in MABs is not, it's somewhat translatable to um, AAVs, but it's not the same. Um, so bringing it in-house, it can be, you know, initial startup costs are going to be a little bit high, um, but in the long run, you can you have the flexibility of having in house. Now, the choice of using a CRO depends on the competency, and that is something that you have to really be critical about: is what type of data are you looking for um, from the CRO? If you're looking for run of the mill um, data, there. Um, basically, you give your CFS and that's it. Then there are CROs for that. If you want more in-depth analyses that gives you both the percent empties, percent full, um, and gives you auto characterization, then there are CROs and mine that can give you that. But at the end of the day, um, it's it's a it's a choice. I the expertise out there in um, CROs are is there for your um, for AUC. You just have to make the, the better choice. Coming in house is also beneficial because you have more control over it. But it, you require to find someone that is really knowledgeable um, in the AUC system to really gain the maximum benefit of that. Thank you, Lake. So from that business decision-oriented question to a question which is more on the regulatory side of things. So here's what the question is. What is the position of the FDA or any other regulatory agency regarding the use of AUC in, for example, quality control, batch or lot release testing for viral vectors? Is it required? Is it encouraged? Any comments? OK, so this I kind of touched upon this a little bit in my talk. Um, it is encouraged slash required because the agencies have seen AUC as release tests. 
it has seen these um, this 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 technique as a critical component of controlling well monitoring your empty capsids uh, or your partial capsids and quality, um, characterizing your system. So yes, it is. Um, I, won't, I can't speak and say if it's required, but I know the agencies have seen this on multiple occasions. So encourage, highly recommend, um, I would say. Um, but again, I'm not speaking, I'm not an FDA or an EMEA person, but from my experience, um, it, is, um, it is one of the techniques they have seen most frequently. Um, and it is used, uh, I've seen it used both as a initial characterization and as the QC re release test. It is moving no, more towards the QC release um, now, um, and it's recommended that you develop methods with the AUC, because you're still going to get the most information from the AUC um, from any other technique, set models, TEM, CRAD-UM, all of that is not, um, either cannot be GM, um, GMP compliant or doesn't provide the information. So AUC is um, pretty much um, the gold standard for this right now. Thank you, Lick. So moving forward, I think we have several questions now which are more on the technical side of things. And uh, I think they're all connected to topics which you have spoken about in your talk. So here's the first one of the technical questions. In the context of C of S analysis, what are the float limits of the F by F0 parameter when it comes to AAV analysis? Okay, so this is this is a very important question because um, um, it's it's very it's related to your um, molecular weight determination and so forth. So the first thing, let's take a look at the f of f zero. This is your shape factor. It comes from your Stokes-Einstein relation relationship. In this case, in you have to know how it's implemented in set fit before you can really understand what's going on with this with this value. So the first thing. In the um, the shape in set fit, this value is average across your your s min and your s max in set fit. So the ranges that you choose, the f of f zero is averaged. Okay, so it takes all the considerations of all the species and says, hey, we're going to use an average shape to describe all of this, all of these species in here. This is how the implementation of the FOF0 is done in said fit. Unlike um, said fit, UltraScan, um, you can put a individual set of um, um, FOF0 for each species in there. Um, you can do that. Now, said fit does have that function. Um, in which you can assign ranges for your FOF0 to describe, um, for example, if you have a bimodality or something like that, you can assign a bimodal FOF0 to one section of the um, of the S ranges and apply another one, uh, another FOF0 to another section. However, we have to be very careful with the FOF0. Um, you should float it because that's the critical parameters in your your system. Now. A lot of people will say, well, your particles are spherical, okay? So that's about 1.2 to 1.3, mainly 1.3 is a perfect sphere. Um, and we can, we can just fix that. But you are, you're, you're bypassing what SETFIT is kind of doing. It needs that value to, to really come to a conclusion. Well, not, not come to a conclusion, but it's some, a critical component in the solution to the LAM equation to get the best, you know, fit. So you want to be able to, you know, escape your local minima and so forth, and go into a local, a global minima. So what I I recommend is you always float that value. I start with a value of 1.3, and it usually settles around that between 1.3 to 1.2. Now, if you start, um, and this is average across the species. Now, what that does once it's average, it kind of messes up your molecular weights. So your molecular weights at this point in time it can be a little bit off. But your molecular weights are not only dependent on your FOF0, it's dependent on your V-bar. Um, and your general rule is if you have a 1% error in your, in your V-bar, it's about 
3% every molecular weight. It also, um, um, your viscosity also affects your molecular weight. Now, I do not use a CFS distribution with a multiple system, multiple species in there and report the molecular weights because it becomes nonsensical at that point. Now, if you have a very good monodispersed system, your FOA of zero um, can give you good estimation of your um, molecular weight, and that's when it is really applied. But you look at you look at the FOA of zero um, for warning signs of what is going on in your system. For example, if you have a, a very high um, a high amount of unsedimented species that is you, you did not man, um, deplete your meniscus, um, you can have your FOA of zero can go high. I mean, it can shoot through the roof. If it goes, if you have DNA in there and you're looking at something um, that is non-spherical, then your FOA of zero is going to approach, you know, uh, above 1.5 to 2.0, and that will give you some idea that, hey, your system is probably elongated or something is it's not perfect. It's, it deviates from a perfect sphere or something like that. So I usually put it between, um, I look for a good fit between 1.3 1.2. I mean, it can get to 1.4, um, but, you know, usually it stays with the viral system between 1.3 to 1.2. Thank you, Lex. So, uh, during your talk, you mentioned different models. So, in that context, here is the next question. Can you comment on the relative advantages and disadvantages of some of the following models? Uh, and the models mentioned are, BCDT or time derivative, LS G star of S, uh, the very popular C of S, and ultrascan 2D spectrum analysis. Okay, so um, the BCDT and LSG star S are related. Um, they're just two different approaches to the um, the, the Fujita approximation. Um, the LSG star is in set fit, and the BCDT is um, in um, um, John Files is John Files program. Now the noise deconvolution is different in between um, DCDT and LSG star. In the terms of DCDT, it's subtracted out first. In um, before the fit in LSG star S um, and in said fit, it's fitted during the fit. So a little bit different approaches to um, the solutions. Um, the um, DCDT um, uses the approximations. Um, based off of Stafford's papers and Philo's work, and LSD star is based off regularization. Um, um, the um, a, a different a linear square approach, and of course the CFS distribution in 2D SA. So let's so let's focus in on the DCDT and LSD star. These are very good or talking about models to look at your data. The biggest problem with these models is that um, it doesn't have the resolution, so you're not going to get um, a, a multiple species, you're going to get a broad peak. Also, these um, DCDT and LSG star, which is um, um, related to the G star S, are Gaussian fits to the data. So those are, I mean, you can do a little bit of trickery with it and get some, you know, multiple species as the polymer guys do. Um, but um, it does, you don't have as much resolution. It is great when you have, you know, a, a good a well-behaved system. But one of the key advantages of the DCDT and LSD star is, uh, specifically the DCDT, is there's no artificial peaks. That is the beauty. So that really helps you to eliminate artificial peaks, okay? So that's something that I use to really help me out. The LSG star is the same way. The LSG star, um, you, you can, I mean, there's advantages in, in the case that you can use more scans for the LSD star at times versus the DCDT, which is a pairwise approach. Um, so that's something you have to take into consideration. Now, the CFS distribution, we, we, we know this, we've beaten a dead horse. You have great resolution with this. Um, this is the, I, I, I'm now going to say that the FDA is, this is what they're seeing, the EMA is what they're seeing. It's the easiest output to understand currently. Now, the 2D um, um, spectrum analysis takes the CF distribution and brings it to a whole different level. Remember, I was talking about your FOMF zeros, in which we're using the average value for um, the CFS distribution. However, for your 2DSA, 
um, you can fit individual species um, and look at different um, f over f0 to describe those species individually. And again, that is um, a very complicated analysis, but it's something that you use to really tease out what is real, what's going on in your system. If you have an ill-behaved system, I usually plug it into both CFS and the 2D SA. Um, Right now, the simplest system to go forward is the simplest output is the CFS solution. If you really want to tackle some of the more complicated programs you've seen abnormalities, I usually use a, comp a combination of all four of these to really figure it out. And you, if you want to really go into this, um, there are great workshops by P. Shook. Uh, for the CFS distributions and by Boris Lemerier for the 2D SFA. And I highly recommend um, you attend both to really get an idea of what these systems are because they are courses in themselves. Good. Thank you, Lake. So, so uh, um, moving forward, can you explain regularization in the context of CFS and compare and contrast the second derivative technique versus maximum entropy. Okay, so I'm going to give my a very high level overview of um, sure. of regularization in this case, and a very high level derivative of max, uh, the second derivative of maximum entropy, because we're not going to get into the equations, and we it, it, these are all a study in themselves. So in terms right. of regularization, um, what we're looking at, um, it's one of the approach to solve the integral equations um, of said fit. And what it does, it looks at um, the probability space for all distributions. Again, we're considering consider all S values um, equal in this case. And we want, what we want to do in a second, in, in, in a very global, we want to explore the space apply it um, as statistically, a, a constraint around it that gives you a statistically accessible fit that best describes the data. So regularization basically um, does this by giving um, some parsimonious distributions and then applying a constraint to it that is slightly worse than the best because you have, again, this is, um, you, this is a course in itself, is because you have oscillations in the system. So what happens, you want to not have as much oscillation, so you take a step back within your constraint to give you a slightly worse fit that still describes statistically your data. And this is one of the approaches to solving for the integral equation, um, the integration, uh, the integral equations to the Lamb equation. So um, that's the, the very high level over, overview of that. Now, the difference between um, the second derivative and the maximum entropy, they're both, um, um, they both select the most parsimonious uh, distributions, all right, that gives you statistically accessible fits. Um, however, the, um, the best distributions is the basis of prior knowledge of the distribution. So um, in terms of second derivatives, we're looking at that total curvature um, in your system. In terms of um, maximum entropy, we're looking at information, um, informational entropy. So I mean, those are, um, uh, those are okay, it's going to be very diff difficult, I'm not very difficult to explain one question. But the difference is, is that what you're looking for is the peak shape. So let, let me just break it down very simply. In maximum entropy, you're going to get very um, asymmetrical peaks, OK? Second derivative will give you very symmetrical peaks. Um, both are statistically relevant and statistically acceptable, so they give you the same kind of the same approach. So I use second derivative of times um, to help my maximum entropy. I mean, and it's just, it's just what your approach is. So one looks at the total curvature, one looks at informational entropy. But one gives you more um, um, statistical, um, 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 it, sorry, um, asymmetrical peaks, one gives you symmetrical peaks. Um, so what you want to, to really um, look at is which one best describes your data. Now, switching to um, back and forth or displaying both is probably a good idea to figure it out, um, to do it. But there's um, better explanations, not better explanations, but more in-depth explanations of 
the second derivative of the maximum entropy in um, um, online at SEDFIT. Um, um, dot com um, analytical authentication dot com. So if you go in there and read that, it will give you some of the, the the key differences that I explained between the two. Thank you, Lake. I do believe that uh, a lot of users are uh, going to be benefited by having an operational understanding of what are best practices while performing a fitting procedure and. I think you've answered some of those questions uh, from that perspective really nicely. So, uh, and moving forward, again, in the context of CFS, can you talk briefly about the relative merits of fitting by either simplex or simulated annealing or by Levenberg Marquardt? Okay, so this is good because this is part of the, um, the algorithms that you're using to get um, your solutions. And the simplex and simulating uh, annealing and your um, Levenberg Marquette are just different approaches to um, getting your your solutions. So in FedFit, the default is your simplex. So these are algorithms that try to get you from a local minima to a global minima. Okay, one of the, the, the key reason, one of the key things I do is switch back and forth between my simplex and my living board market. I can do simulation and annealing at times, but it just computationally, it just takes a longer time. And I, I, I'm, I'm very impatient. So I just use basically the simplex and the um, living market group. So what I would do is after I fit my data, I would switch it over to the market library and do another fit and see where those values look at. So I'm looking at my global chi-square. I recorded the simulated, um, the, the simplex value, RMSD. I recorded the um, 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 the Levenberg uh, Marquette uh, RMSD. I do perform um, both fits, then calculate the global chi-square change. Okay, that's one of the ways you, you can look at it. You're changing, this is to make sure that your data uh, is in a global minima and doesn't change as a function of just switching the algorithms. And the values that you're getting, your distribution that you're getting are pretty much, if you throw the kitchen sink at it, use different algorithms, you're getting the same answer. So usually I switch between back and forth between the two to arrive at um, the answer. Now another way I do it is changing it, um, some of the critical parameters, for example, my FOF0 to a non um, uh, a non-optimal value and see where it converges back by both algorithms and then calculating the, the goal of the goal of chi-square. So I would definitely use both. Um, similarly, on the end, if you have the time and the computational power, go right ahead and do it because that's just, that's that's, that's um, exploring a, a basically a temperature gradient over time. I think you're just changing the values at that point in time. But the simplex to market, if you switch back and forth computationally, is very easy to do, and it can give you a, good, a really good handle on where your global minima is. So I highly recommend doing both. Thank you, Lake. I think uh, what I'm getting out of your um, Q and A discussion is a general idea that. Uh, you're really encouraging the end user to play with the options list and see what happens. And I, I find that really nice, this encouragement. Uh, so with that, we are at the last question we have right now in front of us, and that is, uh, what confidence level do you use during fitting and why? Okay, so I, um, so so we think of it, you know, in the simplest terms, we think of the F the F ratio is a confidence in, interval. And you can say it's, you know, 0.68 is uh, two standard deviations and, you know, um, 0.95 is one standard deviation, right? Um, but it's not only that. Um, so we got to think about it as the amount of regularization that you're using, okay? So um, when I do my fix, the initial thing I do is take off all regularization, I set that value to zero, and I fit the data, and I see exactly what the data looks like without 
any type of regulation. So I know that I list the number of peaks I see where they're at, and then um, I say, okay, without any regulation, this is what I get because I don't want biases in my data, um, and I want these peaks to be described well. Then I usually go to about 0 0.68. 0 0.68 seems to be a very good sweet spot in this case. Um, um, and that really helps with when you have peaks um, that are shoulders that is not described out um, really well. So you're applying a, a certain amount of regularization. So 0 0.68 is a really good value in the sense that you get a good a, a good description of your data, okay? Um, peaks, um, um, there are shoulders, you know, it helps do the discrimination between um, closely re related peaks. Because remember, when I'm doing this, these types of analysis, I have an eye towards a CGMP method. So I have to make sure that this data can, when I'm finished with the fitting, can be applied um, the same way in a QC environment in which I can, you know, have discrete species for good integration, okay? So I'm always thinking that. Now, not to say that 0.95 is, um, um, is bad, but what you do have in there is that it basically, uh, it's not smoothing, okay? It's a difference between smoothing and regularization. But it looks like the peaks, the shoulder peaks kind of disappear because you have, the two species, when you apply a lot of regularization, start to merge. So that shoulder becomes folded into that, that peak, the, the, the peak to the right or the peak to the left, okay? So you have to be very careful with that, knowing that you're in your head that two closely related species, low concentration, they're not very um, um, separated, can merge together. And applying the maximum amount of the, uh, of, of the uh, regularization will merge those peaks. So you have to, uh, this is very key, very critical when you're looking at the empty capsid and the heterogeneity in your uh, partial capsids and now the heterogeneity in your full capsid. So you got to be very careful. You have to be very careful in how much regularization you apply. Personally, I use 0.68. I switch it over to 0.95 to see what those changes are. Again, this is a systematic approach. You have to be able to, you know, confidently say that your fit best describes that data. And very critical, if you're going into a CGMP method for validation and as a release test, it can be done by everyone and is reproducible. Okay, so I always use, I start off with 0.68, switch between 0.95, look at the differences, and my final method, if it's a very good described system, um, usually um, uh, 0.68, I will leave it there. Thank you, Lick, fantastic answer. You know, for what it's worth, uh, I'm going to quote a very senior and highly cited scientist whose name I will not mention. He had once told me that the biophysics world is divided into those who use 0.68 and those who use 0.95 as their preferred confidence level. And the two groups usually don't talk to each other. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so um, I'd like to, um, so we are actually out of time and I want to uh, thank Lake for answering all of these questions in uh, such great detail. I'd like to remind our audience that those questions that we were unable to answer today and those that come in during the on-demand period where the presentation will be available will be answered by Dr. Paul or by myself via the email address that you've provided at the time of registration. So thank you again, Dr. Paul. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, make sure that you read. Um, AUC is a very powerful technique um, and it's very critical in the AAV field, the gene therapy field, um, for characterizing not only your um, AAVs, but every type of serotypes, your, uh, your lentiviruses, retroviruses, it is the gold standard. So I highly recommend that um, you use and, use and implement it and 
make sure you read. It's the, the easiest way to um, overcome the the barrier of learning um, to do the analysis. Well, thank you, Dr. Paul. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Uh, again, the questions that we did not have time to address today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact info which you've provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank Dr. Paul for his time today and for his important research contributions again. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you and goodbye.